If you're buying plants for shade, you need to know what sort of shade you've got. And there are four types, and actually I've got all four in my garden, and you may have two. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog, and this video is a collaboration with the Horticulturalists channel from Melbourne, Australia. The Horticulturalists is run by plant expert and broadcaster Stephen Ryan and Matthew Lucas. And Stephen Ryan is a plant expert, he grows rare plants, and for many years he presented on Gardening Australia, which is the equivalent of Gardener's World here in the UK. And I'm going to talk about the principles of choosing plants for shady parts of your garden. I'm going to give you some of my favourite spring and early summer shade loving plants. And then you can go over to the Horticulturalist channel where Stephen and Matthew will talk about plants for summer and autumn. And the reason for that is because they're based near Melbourne, they're now in autumn, I'm currently in spring. But amazingly, the area around Melbourne, Australia, and Kent in the southeast of the United Kingdom, where I am, both equate to what you'd call a USDA hardiness zone of 9, which means that our winters rarely go below minus 6 Celsius, 21 Fahrenheit. Obviously, the summers near Melbourne and the summers in most USDA hardiness zones of 9 are a lot hotter than they are here in Kent in South East England, but we all grow the same plants and a lot of the plants we're talking about will do well in much cooler zones. Many of them are zones 6 to 9, for example. If you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. And if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, click the subscribe button. They're absolutely free. And if you'd like YouTube to tell you when a new video is uploaded, click the notifications bell. I'll put links to the horticulturalists and their video and any other resources that we mention in the description below and also if you want to jump to any particular part of the video there's a timestamp so just click on that and you'll go straight to the bit that you want. So Stephen explained that there are four different kinds of shady border and I'm standing in one now and that is the classic north facing shady border that would be south facing if you were in the southern hemisphere. Basically this will have a fence or hedge or wall and my wall is quite high and what that means is that it'll really only get sun when the sun is overhead and that will be probably about three hours of sun a day. And although there are lots of plants that are happy to grow in that environment, you do have to make sure that they are plants that are happy in shade. The next category is sometimes called dapple shade or semi shade or partial shade. And typically, this is like a corner of my garden, which actually would be quite sunny, except that I've got a large tree, a Robinia frisia there. And that has leaves on, probably for most of the summer and the autumn. And that means that the plants below it grow in shade. What I've done to increase the sun under that tree is to raise its branches. If you cut off the lower branches, then more sunlight will get to the plants underneath. And of course, you may ask, why doesn't she cut the tree down? And then she could have another sunny border. But actually, the tree has a fantastic presence. It's wonderful for wildlife. It's very good for air quality. It adds proportion and structure and vertical interest in the garden. And its leaves are wonderful in creating a beautiful autumnal display. So what I get from this tree exceeds what I would get from having a low growing border of colorful, sunny plants and it's also protected, it's a listed tree and I would need planning permission to cut it down. The third kind of shade is seasonal shade and I also have this. Seasonal shade is an area that would be sunny except that it has deciduous trees in it. So it's shady in summer when the leaves are on the trees. From about late autumn to early summer the leaves are not on the trees so it is a sunny bed and I have four deciduous trees in a sunny spot and in early spring, I get all the beautiful bulbs, tulips, daffodils, leucogium. It's just the most colorful part of the garden. And the bulbs need the sunshine in order to create the flowers for next year, but they get enough time because by the time early summer comes, the leaves are back on the tree, it's shady, but the bulbs have taken all the nutrition they need. Now, once again, you might say, why not cut down the trees and have another sunny border? But actually, in every single season of the year, the trees do once again give me more. The white bark of the silver birch is the most important part of my winter garden. In spring, the amelanchia and the ornamental cherry both have the most wonderful white blossom at different times. And in summer, the cotinus has deep red leaves and wonderfully smoky 
flowers. It's called a smoke bush, and it's the most remarked upon plant in my garden. So those four trees together give me much more than just extending my sunny border wood. The fourth type of shade is deep shade. And that's where really very little or no sunlight ever goes. It's really difficult to grow things in deep shade. And Stephen says that there's a plant called Ruscus or Butcher's Broom that will grow in deep shade, but not much else will. So you really have to think in a slightly different way about this part of your garden. I've got an area of deep shade in my garden. It's along the north facing wall, which would be south facing in the southern hemisphere. But I've also got two evergreen trees on that wall. And the combination of being north facing and evergreen trees means that there are a few little patches where there simply is no sunlight. And if you've got that, just look and see if weeds grow there, because if weeds don't grow, quite frankly, plants aren't going to grow. So you could use it for something else. You could put a bench or a table under there for some nice shady seating. And you could put pots if you're prepared to do the faff of swapping things in pots over three or four times a year. But the other thing to do is to take a leaf out of the book of woodland gardens. I recently interviewed Lucy Adams at Doddington Place Gardens about woodland gardens. And she said that one of the best places to plant plants is on the woodland edge. And that is the edge of the canopy of the tree. Now then, the canopy of the tree obviously is its leaf mass. And some trees have quite a spreading canopy and some have quite a columnar and upright canopy. But when the sun is completely overhead of an evergreen tree, then the canopy is the amount of shade that you'll see on the ground. It could be narrow or it could be quite a big circle. If you plant on the ground underneath the edge of that canopy, then the sun is going to reach it certainly for a few hours a day. You'll still have to choose shade loving plants, but you will have quite a few options. And if you look at my two evergreen trees, the space between them could be called a woodland edge because it's very close to the edge of the canopy of the trees. And I find that quite a lot grows in there. I've got hydrangea arborescence Annabelle, I've got rosa glauca, I've got primroses, cyclamen, hellebores, I've got something called a shrub called Osmanthus de Lavii, and I'll go into some of these plants later on. So this really is quite a lot growing there, but it's just not going to grow directly under the tree near the trunk. Just look and plant a little bit further out. And you can actually increase the planting area by taking away some of the lower branches because then a bit more sun will get in. You might ask, of course, once again, why have I got two evergreen trees in this very shady part of the garden? And that's because they're blocking out a very ugly street lamp. They do provide some lovely structure in winter because obviously they're evergreen and they're a wonderful shelter for wildlife. And of course, they're good for air quality. So once again, I don't want to cut them down. And in fact, by choosing the right plants, we can plant round them and that area of the garden can look beautiful. And the other thing about this particular bed the weeds don't grow as well and the plants don't grow as fast. So actually, it's much easier to look after. So once you've identified what sort of shade you have, it's important to plant for seasonal interest. Try to get a plant that looks great in either every month of the year or every season of the year. And of course, I'm doing the early spring and summer plants and Stephen and Matthew are doing the later summer and autumn plants on the Horticulturalists channel. So, what about the beginning of the year, late winter, early spring? Well, snowdrops grow fantastically under trees. I've even managed to get them growing under the canopy of the evergreen tree. And they really do say winter is just beginning to come to its end. In terms of winter shrubs, if you want a deciduous shrub, one that loses its leaves in winter, then winter hazel or Coriolopsis is a good choice. It's got pale lemon flowers. And for evergreen shrubs, I'd like to remind you how magnificent a Mahonia can be. Mahonia is a brilliant sculptural evergreen shrub with lovely spiky leaves and bright yellow flowers. Now, it's been rather forgotten about over the last few decades because it's such an easy plant. It tends to be grown in things like supermarket car parks and town centre car parks. And sometimes it just gets hacked at by people with chainsaws who don't really understand gardening. So it finishes up looking very uncomfortable. But if you prune it properly or even just simply leave it alone, it's a wonderfully architectural plant and I think its time is coming again. 
If you're looking for good shade-loving perennials that flower well in early spring, then hellebores are the stars of the show. They're such pretty, delicate plants, and they're so easygoing. I've really never had to do much to any of my hellebores, but they're growing very happily on the woodland edge in my deep shade borders and also in my partial shade borders. Going a little bit later in the year, you have so many choices, but I am particularly keen on Mediterranean Spurge, or Euphorbia wolfenii, which actually kind of roams around my garden, sort of putting itself down wherever it feels like it. And it's got this lovely chartreuse green. One plant that looks good in late spring, early summer is Smyrnium perfoliatum or Perfoliate alexanders. And every time I put this on my Instagram feed, someone says, what is that plant? It's a biennial, so it won't do anything in its first year, and then it flowers in its second year, and then it self-seeds very vigorously. <laughs> and when it comes to shrubs, Viburnum opulus, or the snowball bush, is just lovely. It has lovely white pom-pom flowers in early spring. It does very well in shade. Some varieties have got red berries. You just need to check whether it's a sterile variety or not if you want the berries. And that is the most magnificent autumn colour. So that is a really good shade-loving early spring and also autumn plant. I'm also very impressed by something called Osmanthus delavii. It's a dark green shrub with very pretty white flowers. And this one has been growing directly beneath the evergreen Magnolia grandiflora. So it's been growing in pretty deep shade. It grows very slowly. It's taken about eight years to get to this stage, but I think it's a very worthwhile plant. And as good shade-loving ground cover, Saxifrage London Pride has a very delicate, pretty flower. And I've got it growing directly beneath my evergreen Magnolia grandiflora. But the only thing you do have to remember is that Magnolia grandiflora loses its leaves throughout the year, being an evergreen. They do lose their leaves, but they just do them throughout the year. And it has very big, leathery leaves. And if they land on ground cover plants, they'll just ban all the light. So you do have to clear those leaves up from time to time. One of the things people always want to know is what about colourful flowers for shade? There are so many lovely whites and yellows and of course they look gorgeous in shade. But if you want colour, then begonias are very shade tolerant. There's a huge selection of them. Some begonias have become quite sort of car park plants as well. But actually you'll be able to find one that suits your colour scheme. And some of them have gorgeous elaborate leaves as well. They're very tender, you won't be able to plant them out all year round, and they do do particularly well in pots. The other colourful plant that does well in shade is Impatiens, or Busy Lizzie, and for a while that disappeared off our shelves because it had a sort of virus or something, but there are now Busy Lizzies back and available to buy. Stephen and Matthew are now going to join me on the Middle Size Garden to tell you a couple of their favourite shade-loving plants, so let's go over to them. Hello, we're the Horticulturalists and I'm Stephen Ryan. I'm Matthew Lucas, Stephen is the guru and thank you Alexandra. Here are our spring summer selections for shady gardening. Yes, everybody knows what a hosta is. They do, yes. I love hostas and this one is mine growing in a pot but we'll get to that. They are sort of classical woodland plants for shady gardens. Yes. We all know the diversity within the genus. We know that there's green ones, there's silvery blue ones, mm -hmm. there's variegated ones. We have one prepared earlier yes, here. Yes, here's our uh, variegated. And they do have very attractive flowers in the late spring, early summer, but it's for their foliage that most of us grow them. Of course, they're dormant in the winter, so they die down. And they have one major downside, I think. What's that? snails and slugs mm. and in fact this variegated one we bought along is actually slightly snail ridden you know you've been naughty if you allow your hostas to become snail ridden and they make you pay for it the whole rest of the season now i use an iron based organic slug and snail pellets yes which works brilliantly for me product works fine uh, and it's non-dangerous for bird life and other yeah. creatures around my only hesitation with it is it does take a little while to start killing slugs and snails and i have found quite regularly that well they eat this pellet and then they go on and have a dessert with the hosta and then they go off and, and die. Then the day. So their death isn't fast enough for yeah, you Mr. No, right? not for me. I you have want to a say. quick death. Yes exactly. Look in some areas you don't get a lot of slugs and snails they're not a problem mm. but they'll grow in a wide range of environments we all know that they like a certain amount of moisture but 
but they're not water hungry. And where are they from? Are they a Chinese species originally? Yeah, mainly through Asia. China, Japan is mm. where most of the wild hostas come from. Mm. There are multitudes of man-made hybrids and selections and variegated mutants and <laughs> everything out there. Oh, a variegated mutant. I think yeah. I've seen that film. Yeah. And this is my uh, grandiflora. Mm. And as we are now in autumn in Australia, this was at its peak a couple of months ago yep. in summer. The foliage is really large and beautiful. And the flower had these enormous white lily-like mm. flowers. Did you sniff? The fragrance was unbelievable. Yeah. And so my experience has been that hostas do really well in pots. And I think that's how I'm able to control the slugs and snails better because it is. Yeah. you scatter your organic pellets around as you plant the tuber so that those poor snails have gone to heaven before the hosta yeah. emerges. You've given up on hostas. I have only just begun. And so the next cab off our spring, summer, four shade rank is going to be a shrub. Yes, and in fact, again, a classic shrub that everybody knows likes a bit of shade. Yes. And that's the hydrangea. I mean, it's a biggish genus. People don't realize how much diversity there is. There mm. are climbing ones, there are dwarf ones, there are large bushes almost verging on tree ones. Hydrangeas in general fall into two major sort of groups. You have the lace cap ones, which have the bracted flowers around the outside with the big petal like bracts and yeah. the little tiny petal flowers inside. And then you have the big mop headed ones, which are basically nine tenths sterile hybrids. Forms of hydrangea macrophylla, which is the unfair to say the common garden hydrangea, but, the, common. but in fact it is the most commonly met with group of hydrangeas in gardens. So it's the mop head type and in acid soils they'll be blue, in alkaline soils they'll be pink. They're easy to grow, they'll grow in coldish climates quite well, they'll cope with warmish climates, but they do need plenty of summer moisture and depending on the variety they need appropriate pruning. And are all of them shade lovers? Almost all of them. There are mm. one or two that will tolerate a fairly open sunny aspect, particularly amongst the Mexican climbing species. And the other hydrangea we visited last week mm. was one of the North American species, Hydrangea quercifolia, the oak leafed hydrangea. They are a wonderful shrub, as much for their foliage as their flowers, and I have to say many hydrangeas don't have foliage of huge merit. But the oak leaf one is fantastic. It has leaves somewhat like a North American pin oak. Yep. In areas where you get cold winters, the foliage gets the most fabulous burgundy colours in the foliage right through the winter. It doesn't completely shed all its foliage. And you get these long conical heads of flowers instead of the classical sort of rounded mop headed sort of flower that you expect from a normal hydrangea. And so really there's something going on all year with that because yep. you've got spring foliage, you've got late spring flowers which then stay on and sort of dry don't they throughout yep. the season and then you have the most amazing autumn foliage and again shade loving. Not as much so as the classical hydrangeas. The macrophyllas need a little more shade and certainly more moisture. Yeah. So the oak leaf hydrangea can come out of the shadows a little bit more. So it doesn't need as much water, doesn't need as much shade. And in fact, if it's out in the open a little bit more, it will actually colour better in its foliage for its winter effect. Ah, interesting. Is it fair to say that most of those hydrangeas grow in pots really well? They do, as long as the pot's a decent size and as long as one keeps up with the appropriate watering. There we are, Alexandra. Those are our early season flowering shrubs and perennials that love a bit of shade. Exactly. Over to you. I do agree Stephen and Matthew. I think hydrangeas are some of the best shade loving plants you can get and there are just so many colours and shapes and styles. They're just fabulous and I've got a video which is in the description below on how to grow hydrangeas and now I think it's time for you to pop over to the Horticulturalist channel and find out some more really great shade loving plants for summer and autumn. There's a Shady Gardens playlist at the end of this video and if you'd like more tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden then do subscribe to the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and thank you for watching. Goodbye.